Okay, welcome to another edition of uh, Blogging Heads. My name is Meir Javedanfar. I'm um, joined by my colleague Emily Landa from the INSS Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv. Uh, Emily is one of the best known experts on proliferation and nuclear weapons proliferation and also on Iran's nuclear program uh, in Israel. She's somebody I... Um, I respect very much. Her opinion is very important to me. We don't always agree, but uh, welcome to Israel. <laughs> we always have very lively debates here, and I think um, it's going to be very entertaining and very more important and informative for everybody to, to hear the kind of conversations we have in Israel about the Iranian nuclear program. Just to catch up, my name is Meir Javedanfar. I'm an Iranian-Israeli Middle East analyst. I teach contemporary Iranian politics at the Inter Interdisciplinary Center, and I write about Iran at the Iran Israel Observer blog. So, good afternoon, Emily. How are you doing? Hi, Mayel. Great here. It's great to have you here on the program. I really look forward to sharing knowledge and also learning from you. Um, one of the issues that I'd like to kick, kick it off with today is um, to ask your opinion. Do you think the Geneva deal that was signed between Iran and the P5 plus one uh, is a good deal for Israel? Oh, that's a gigantic question. Uh, the question of the day, question of the week, question of the month. Um, I think this deal uh, is not a reason for celebration, certainly. Um, I don't think it's a, an historic achievement uh, for the P5 plus one. I think it's an interim deal. Um, its goal is to basically freeze Iran's nuclear activity for the duration of the negotiations, which need to proceed on securing, obviously, a comprehensive deal. Um, so, the, you know, we need to uh, look at this deal in those terms. So to say that the deal has not stopped Iran's nuclear program or dismantled Iran's nuclear program is true, but that's not what the deal was meant to do. So it's not really um, the correct line of criticism. But I think we should be looking at this deal in terms of what it's supposed to do, which is to open space, put time on the clock for a serious negotiation about the comprehensive deal. That's the real deal that needs to be on the table. And so the questions with regard to the interim deal whether it's good or bad, I think, um, need to be posed in those terms. Is it really freezing the situation, first of all? Um, will it really open up the kind of space that's needed for uh, negotiations on a comprehensive deal? Um, what about the sanctions relief? And there has been sanctions relief. And we already are seeing reports that the uh, the dollar sign on the sanctions relief uh, is probably going to be much higher than the dollar sign that has been talked about, which was something around seven billion dollars. It's probably going to be more than that. Question is, what will that do in terms of um, Iran's willingness to move forward, really, to this comprehensive deal? If we take into account that they're at the table mainly to get sanctions relief. And finally, I mean, the basic question that needs to be asked, and we still do not have the answer, and this is the question that needs to be asked for the final deal. Because if the answer to the question that I'm about to pose is yes, then it should be a very easy route to a final deal. If the answer is no, then we're going to be uh, looking at a very difficult, rocky road a lot of uh, tactical bargaining, and we could very well end up after a year or maybe a year and a half with no comprehensive deal, and then there will be serious concerns. And the question is, has Iran made the decision to back away from its military <coughs> nuclear aspirations? That is the key question. And as of yet, as I said, we don't have an answer to that. There's no indication that Iran has made that decision. And as long as it doesn't make that decision, what we're going to see in this interim period is a lot of haggling over interpretations 
Iran will be trying to interpret this interim deal in a manner that it can get maximum sanctions relief, obviously, and minimum concessions on the nuclear front. So they'll be looking to interpret this in a way where they can still continue some of the activities that they would like to continue. And I'll just give two examples and then turn over to you. We already saw three days after the interim deal was secured, we already heard Zarif uh, proclaiming that Iran would continue with certain construction work at Iraq. And this was one of the points of contention in Geneva. It seemed that, the, that this was resolved in the direction of Iran not being allowed to do any construction work there. Um, Zarif was presenting, obviously, a different interpretation. That's one example. And just two days ago, uh, in the context of the IAEA inspector's visit to Iran, we already heard um, an Iranian official say that Iran is continuing with testing of the advanced new generation centrifuges, which is another issue of serious concern with regard to their uh, military nuclear aspirations. So these are the kind of dynamics, these are the kind of uh, 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 statements and positions that give, uh, you know, um, they, they, they raise um, concerns and they raise thoughts that perhaps Iran is not really negotiating in good faith. In other words, it's not really moving towards this comprehensive deal that will mean backing away from its military aspirations. Um, I think uh, you raised some interesting points and I'll bring them up regarding Iraq. But um, at a macro level, I agree with you that this is a good interim deal. Uh, at a micro level, I also have to say it's a good, good interim deal. And again, I have to emphasize the word interim here. This is not the final deal. Um, I think it's good for the state of Israel because um, using democracy and uh, using, excuse me, diplomacy and using the power of sanctions, um, the West, uh, the P5 plus one, has got something that in, in, in the short term and in an interim manner, it's good for the state of Israel. And that is Iran uh, stopping its uh, enrichment at 20% and Iran not continuing to work on the IR-40 reactor. Um, I think this is something that we could not have achieved on our own and even not even sure that uh, if, this, if the diplomatic track succeeds, we could have achieved it with the, with the military uh, option. But I think this is something that as an interim is good, good for the state of Israel because now we know at least that the Iranians are, are, have stopped some of the sensitive parts of the nuclear program while they're talking. It would have been unacceptable for us that, you know, if the Iranian, while we're talking, or while the P5 plus one is talking, the Iranians would be continuing to take part in activities regard, which they could use to make a weapon. Now, in terms of, is, has Iran, you raised the interesting point, has Iran stopped the military part? Well, as uh, in the last uh, Herzliya conference in, um, in uh, my, uh, my university, my college, uh, Mr. Avi, uh, General Avi Kohavi of the military intelligence said that Ayatollah Khamenei has not taken a decision to make a weapon yet. Now, I know they could be doing things on the side, which when they decide to make a weapon, they could put it together. That, as far as we know, Iran has not answered them, and we need to have that as part of a final deal. But from what we know, Iran, the Ayatollah Khamenei has not made a decision to make a nuclear weapon. He has not made that decision yet. They stopped that in 2003. Some people say later on, but it seems that he has not given the decision to make a weapon. Now, in terms of Iraq, you're absolutely right in that Mr. Z uh, Javad Zarif has been saying that. But if you look at the text of the deal, Emily, it says, Iran shall not add any components to the reactor. That's the text of the deal, which means that Iran can't touch the reactor, can't add anything to the IR-40 reactor. Now, if they decide to make a room next to the reactor, that's not part of the deal. <laughs> what is part of the deal? Now, I know, of course, everybody tries to have their own... But we have to see what's in the deal. So when Zarif, you know, when the Iranians, if they're going to build the room next to it, as long as it doesn't contribute anything, as long as the reactor is not touched, which is what we're concerned about, that's not inside the deal. That was not negotiated. And the most important thing here is that Iran is not continuing to work on the IR-40 reactor, which as far as we know, they're not. Now, in terms of uh, another point you raised uh, about the Iranians working on the centrifuges, as far as I remember, the, the deal said that the Iranians have to declare the sites where they manufacture the centrifuges and where they uh, also manufacture, where they assemble the centrifuges 
and also and the, the sites where they uh, where they make the um, the rotor blades. Now I don't know if that if they're working on the uh, on the new generation of uh, centrifuges that's included. I have to look at the text, but I think one thing we have to take into consideration, and I think it will bring us to the next section of the discussion, is uh, we will have, you know is Iran going to abide by the deal or not? We have to remember that here in Israel we have our own domestic politics. And in Iran, they have their own domestic politics. Zarif and Rouhani have a lot of enemies. And sometimes, you know, they, they come up with these descriptions of the deal uh, in order to, um, to play to their own side, to placate their own side. What is their most important thing is for us to watch out for is their action. And this is something that has been said before. There is a lot of domestic politics. Zarif and Rouhani have more enemies inside the Iranian regime than, than outside. There is a lot of people who are unhappy about what's happening. They're doing this reluctantly. And I think that Zarif and Rouhani sometimes say these things in words, I emphasize again, in words, in order to um, buy some time for themselves. They're not very, I'm not, you know, I'm, you don't have to be happy about them, and I certainly don't welcome them. But what's going to be important is uh, the actions of Iran, and I think they will abide by the deal because of the way the economy is suffering, which is hurting the Revolutionary Guard and, and, and the Supreme Leader's own uh, business empire. Just wondering what you think. Well, let me react to a few things that you said, um, and not in any particular order. But let me start with this issue of the decision to go for nuclear weapons. We have to differentiate between making a decision to actually manufacture nuclear weapons and working on a military nuclear program or having military nuclear aspirations. Right. These are two different issues. So when anyone makes the, the statement that we have no indication that Iran has actually made the decision to start manufacturing nuclear bombs, that's correct. But that doesn't mean that we're not tremendously concerned with, it, with Iran's military nuclear aspirations. They are working on creating the components and a vast nuclear infrastructure that will be ultimately a fait accompli, will be unstoppable, and then they will be able to go to nuclear weapons at a time of their choosing. But if Iran reaches that stage where they have created a fait accompli, um, where they can no longer be stopped from making that move to actually um, creating nuclear weapons, then we're in a very bad situation. So we shouldn't be uh, pacified by uh, knowing that there's no intelligence reports that indicate that Iran has made that decision. That's not the important question. The question is whether that's where they're going, that's what they're working on, and that they're trying to reach the stage where they have neutralized any effective opposition. Once they're at that stage, they may even not decide to go all the way. That will give them already deterrence and clout in the region, which is what they're looking for ultimately uh, with regard to their military Can you give some examples of what they could be doing or, you, you know, uh, what's been heard well, about? Well, wait, before I go there, I will, I will go there, but let me just uh, react okay. to a few other things that you said because I think there's, these are important points. And, and the concerns that I raised, I think, are still valid even taking into account um, what you said in reaction. Let's just take the enrichment to 3.5%. Yes, they're not allowed to increase their stockpiles. However, according to the interim deal, they don't, it's not like they enrich a little bit uh, to 5% and then have to turn it immediately into oxide. No, they will be enriching to 5%, and only at the end of the period do they have to show that it has all been turned into oxide. So they have... Uh, months in which they will be accumulating um, low enriched uranium, which we know is very dangerous, especially when that is married with advanced centrifuges. So if for some reason after six months things break down for whatever reason, they will have the increased stockpile. So they are advancing in that respect. Um, with regard, again, to the uh, advanced centrifuges, yes, 
If you go according to the letter of the agreement, this was one of the concerns that I was raising as they were negotiating this deal. What about the testing of these centrifuges? Okay, they can't operate them. But according to the IAEA report, the, the, the stage that they have reached right now is the stage of testing these advanced centrifuges. That's what they have to go through now before they can operate them in any case. So if, according to this interim deal, they are not prohibited from testing these advanced centrifuges, then they are, in effect, advancing their program, because that's the stage that they need to go through right now. So again, we see the holes in this interim agreement, the loopholes in this interim agreement that lend themselves to too much interpretation. And what we're seeing is that Iran is choosing to interpret things in a manner that allows them in at the fringes, in these areas where they can do so, to still advance their program. And the same is true with regard to Iraq. It's not that they're building outside the uh, facility some, uh, you know, uh, building that has no relevance to what's going on in Iraq. Obviously, when Zarif says we will continue construction just outside the facility, he's talking about construction that is relevant to the final operation of Iraq. So we can't be naive about what kind of construction he's talking about. Overall, I would say Iran is not likely to blatantly defy the interim agreement. The problem with this agreement is that it leaves too many gray areas. It leaves too much room for interpretation that I have no doubt, because I've already seen indications of this, that Iran will interpret in a manner that allows it to move forward in whatever aspect it can move forward. And this, at the end of the day, is not really behaving um, in good faith. And then we have the whole sanctions issue, which we can discuss. About the military, uh, you know, what, what a military yeah. capability gives Iran, what, could, what it can do um, with that capability that it can't do today. Uh, what I think Iran is going for is to sort of clinch that regional clout that it is seeking. But that, right? Sorry, that so wasn't it, my question. My question was in terms oh. of military activity, you said that they've taken part in military activities for the nuclear program, which uh, they're continuing with. Do you have any examples no, of no, that? No, no. First of all, the whole aspect of the military dimensions of their program, unfortunately, didn't even come into the interim deal. Okay. So the whole possible, what they call the PMD, the possible military dimensions mm -hmm. of Iran's nuclear program, are not part of the interim de uh, deal. That has all been pushed to the comprehensive deal, and you can be sure that that is going to be a very, very difficult issue that, uh, you know, when Obama says there's 50-50 chance to get a comprehensive deal, I'm sure he's thinking about that issue. And what this refers to is the kind of testing that Iran was conducting, for example, at Parchin. And here's another issue of concern, right? The IAEA for two years has been seeking entry to Parchin because of the IAEA uh, report of late 2011 with all the possible military dimensions, possible testing of explosives that were going on at Parchin. Uh, the IAEA has been to Iran something like six to eight times over the past two years asking for entry to Parchin in order to check that out. The Iranians have each time led them to believe that they will allow them into Parchin. They get to Iran and then they say no entry into Parchin. Suddenly, the IAEA is not talking about Parchin anymore. What happened to Parchin? Why is that no longer on the agenda? And the only inspections that we saw over the past few days were to Iraq. So the whole military dimension, all of the suspicions, the very strong sus suspicions about actual military work, okay. not dual-use technology, but military work, has not even begun to be discussed. In terms of, uh, you said that it's not that important. Uh, oh, I can't hear you now, Mayor. Sorry, uh, you said that it's not that okay. important that uh, that it's um, that Khamenei has not made a decision. I have to disagree with you there. I think the fact that Khamenei has not made a decision to put everything together is very important for a number of reasons. Number one, it shows that they've listened to the red line of President Obama. Some people may not think that you know the Iranians take it seriously. 
I think they do. I think Khamenei could have given the go ahead to make that uh, to make that weapon before, but the fact that he stopped, yes, I think it's a sign that first of all Khamenei takes the red line seriously. Number two, I think the, it also shows that the Iranian regime has not made the final decision to make an actual bomb because they are worried whether they can afford it because of the the, the strong reaction uh, that they've seen from the from the international uh, community. Now, especially the economy. Now, I think what's something that's very important is that we have to also see, yes, you know, uh, you said that uh, the Iranians may not be acting in good faith. I think, again, we have to go back to say, you know, politicians say some things because they have domestic politics, but we can't judge them by what they're saying to their own people. Because I'll give you an example. Recently, there was an Iranian member of parliament, and I remember this, this was in, when I was in New York, it was about seven weeks ago, two months ago almost, he said that Iran has stopped enrichment at 20%. He said, we don't need it anymore, we've stopped. And everybody, you know, and why did he say it? Because there was some domestic issue between the different factions and he decided to go one against the other. So I think, you know, they, will the Iranians go against the word? We have to give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's see. I'm not going to judge them, knowing, you know, uh, studying Iranian domestic politics. I'm not going to judge them by what they say to their own, uh, to their own people, to the, to, uh, to the right-wingers. Because if, if we take what they have to say, for example, Hussein Shariat Madari, the head of Kehan, as soon as the, uh, the, the, the agreement was signed, the, the, one of the headlines, I think, was not the day after, the day after that, two days after the agreement, said the Americans have broken the agreement within one hour. It's, you know, of course he has an interest to see it doesn't make, it doesn't, uh, doesn't succeed. So yes, they say these things to their own audience. I think the Iranians have to be judged by what they do. But also we have to recognize, I agree with you about Parchi, and I also agree with you about the possible military dimensions. Iran has to answer them, for sure, for sure. But until such times that we know whether they are actually making a weapon, we can't say we definitely that they are doing things to make a weapon. But, also, but, when, but, but when you have indication that they're making a weapon, Mayor, it will be too late. Keep that in mind. Uh, absolutely. If, yeah, these if you wait have till to then, be, it's game over. These things have to be as part of the final deal, Emily. You know, and this is something we'll, end, we'll talk about at the end of our conversation. As part of a final, no final deals will be recognized as a final or a good deal if especially it doesn't include Iran answering questions about previous military aid dimensions. You know, the um, uh, nuclear trigger that they were testing, the, the, the nuclear war, war, uh, the warhead design that they were testing for missile, yes. But again, these are possible. They have to be addressed, but doesn't mean that the Iranians are right now continuing with them. But this is something that we have to, uh, we have to wait till, till the end of the, uh, till the end of the negotiations. And I think this is something, it's going to be a very bitter pill for the Iranian regime to swallow because for years, They've been saying, oh, our nuclear program is being put for, for civilian purposes only. And now they're going to have to answer about some of the illegal dimensions of the nuclear program. One other point I'd like to add, um, Emily, and I think, you know, in Israel, there's not much appreciation on what's happening on the other side. Now, I know the Iranian regime has acted in a terrible manner towards the state of Israel. But we have to look at everything within the context. Look at the Iranians. They're doing things that they, it's not actually, they don't have to do them. That it's not in the IAEA, it's not in the IAEA obligation for them to have to show the centrifuge making facilities, but they're doing it. It's not in the IAEA obligation to give inspections to the, re the, the reactor that produces the heavy water, because the heavy water is not the issue, it's the IR-40. Of course they have to answer questions to the IR-40, but they're going beyond, beyond their commitments to the IAEA in this stage of the deal. And I think that also needs to be recognized. To us in Israel, it may not mean much. But if you look at the ecosystem of the Iranian politics and the world over there, this is something very significant. And again, this is something that gives me hope that despite what the Iranian politicians say to their own audience, in action, we could actually be, uh, we could be surprised, pleasantly surprised by the cooperation. I'm just being optimistic here. Well, you know, when you say you want to give them the benefit of the doubt, I, I'm not sure on what basis you're giving them the benefit of the doubt. Because, because they're doing Iran, things beyond their, their responsibility. No, and look, once they, they've, they have uh, entered into the negotiation on the interim deal and it's supposed to uh, freeze the program, these are sort of 
obvious uh, 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 parts of the deal. And even with that, the deal has many, many holes, uh, as I've pointed out. So I'm not sure that the interim deal is something that uh, goes, uh, you know, against Iran too much. I think I think it's really, unfortunately, not a bad deal for Iran. And again, I I, I have to underscore it for a regime that has not yet taken the decision, and you talked about the decision to go for nuclear weapons, but I can't emphasize enough that the real decision that needs to be made is to back away from their military aspirations. When Libya possible decided military to go back, possible. no, well, when, when, possible. when Libya, no, we, there, there's enough, uh, there's enough evidence out there, Mayor, even if you take the 2007 uh, NIE, I agree with okay? you. I agree so, they did stop, but I'm just saying it's possible that they could. No, no, wait, but didn't. I'm saying that the, the, you know, Rouhani has said that Iran never worked on a military That's a lie. Program. That's a so lie. So according to all intelligence, <laughs> yes. at least up until 2003, yes, yes, according to a lot of yes, suspicions yes. beyond that. I agree. Um, but, but my point was that a state like Libya, when they in 2003 made the decision to back away from all WMD, like Syria just a few months ago, under duress, under pressure, but when Assad made the decision to join the CWC, it, it, it was implemented almost immediately. In other words, when a state makes a decision mm -hmm. to actually back away from a certain category of WMD, it goes very quickly. The mm -hmm. fact that there, we're in such a prolonged process is indication of the fact that we're not there yet. We're in a, we're still in a tactical bargaining uh, uh, dynamic. And Iran's bargaining game is maximum sanctions relief for minimum nuclear concessions. The reason Iran is at the table is to get sanctions relief, and they're not yet at the table to back away from their military aspirations. And I think that's the major problem. Why has Iran not earned our trust? Because this whole crisis began with facilities that Iran. I agree with had you about that. I agree hidden. with you about that. that and they, in they 2009 again. I agree with Go you ahead. that they haven't been forthcoming. But Emily, well, at the no, same it's time, it's not only not forthcoming. For Doe was not. I agree. With, I know yeah. about Nathan, and I agree with you all about that. But we also, at the same time, we have to take into consideration everything that Iran has done wrong in terms of its responsibilities to the IAEA. But we also cannot say, like our Prime Minister is saying, that nothing has changed. Things are changing. What we are seeing, and it's not because they're doing it voluntarily, they didn't wake Tactically, up one day they because they decided to be nice. Because of the sanctions, they exactly. are doing other things which we, we have to wait and judge by their actions. No, that's true, but the lesson should be that pressure <clears throat> works, sanctions brought them to the table, and if the and here maybe we should uh, g uh, move on to Obama. the uh, yeah to the Obama administration and the way they're playing this game. If you let up, the only pressure, the only leverage that you have in a very difficult negotiation, right. you are very likely not to reach your goal. So we both agree that the Iranians are at the table yes. for sanctions relief, and yes. this has caused a tactical change, but what we're interested in is not the tactical change, but the real strategic decision to back away. And I think that as if pressure starts letting up, Iran will have no interest to make that decision, and they will continue with their tactical game. Pressure here in this very difficult negotiation is the key to success. And I think it needs to be understood that if sanctions are let up, um, it's just not going to work. If they start to unravel, it's not going to work. If a, a serious threat of military force, if Iran does not make that decision, is not on the table, uh, the international community will not get where it wants to go. I, in terms of pressure, I agree with you. But in terms of, um, again, I, I, I look at the... Uh, I look at this, I try to also look at this of what works in Iran, because what necessary, what may work in Israeli political world with its own laws of gravity and with its own ecosystem may not work in the American and may not work in the Iranian and vice versa. Um, in terms of the, you know, uh, uh, Iran being getting more pressure, Iran is already on pressure. And this is the reason why Khamenei is uh, doing this. And it's the reason why he allowed Rouhani to be elected. 
How many did not wake up after killing so many people in 2009 through those false elections? He didn't wake up in 2013 deciding for no reason that this time he's going to allow the people of Iran to have a voice. Here a we're in complete one. agreement. <laughs> so, you know, this is, this is the situation. Now, now, the thing where I disagree with you, Emily, is this, how much pressure? You know, everything has a point of diminishing return. Everything, when it comes to investment, even when it comes to farming, how much, you know, how much different mixes of fertilizer, seed, etc., etc. In this, it's very important that if the Iranians are showing good faith in their actions, I go back again, not the words, in action, it means it, that we don't impose additional sanctions. It, you know, it's a very simple Pavlovian response that if the other side is taking a positive step, the least you can do is not to take any negative steps towards them. Now, we have the pressure, the major sanctions are not being uh, removed. What, are, what is being removed is Iran is being transferred $7 billion worth of its oil income, plus um, some of the sanctions regarding the uh, precious metals, which I think the, um, the total comes between somewhere between 10 to $15 billion. This is no way enough for the Iranian regime to ignore the talks. And it is no way enough for the Iranian regime to say, well, all the sanctions have been removed from us, so we can do whatever we want. That's not the situation. But if, again, we see Iran is taking a positive step and we impose tougher sanctions, and by that I mean our friends in the Congress impose tougher sanctions against Iran, then what do you expect the Iranians to do? They take a positive step forward for it, and then they get punished for it. What would anybody else do? This is my concern. Well, this you know is my what? only concern. Mayor, I think, first of all, this is a very, it's a fascinating discussion that we're having because I think that at the end of the day, I mean, the examples that I've given of Iran already trying to interpret things in their direction um, with Zarif and with their announcement with regard to the advanced centrifuges, you're saying that's for domestic consumption. They don't really mean it. Let's wait to see. What they do well, in the next six the months. Testing, with regard to the testing, they actually said that they're doing it. So it's not, I mean, but that's not part of the deal. So it. they're not breaking the deal, Emily. But it okay, should have been part of what? the deal. You know what? First of all, it's sort of a difficult argument that statements are made for domestic consumption because then always the counter question is, well, when are we supposed to believe them? It's like when there's all the horrific rhetoric against Israel, the terrible, terrible rhetoric. So there are always those that say, oh, no, but it's just for public consumption. It's just for, you know, and I, my question always is, well, I'm a little bit worried about those people that for them, you know, that's a good message that Israel is a cancer in the region. If those are the people that they're talking to because they think that those are good messages, that even in itself is worrying. But even, uh, you know, I, I can't actually accept that everything that leaders say or, uh, you know, important things that leaders say we can be satisfied with that it's just for public consumption. But you don't have to be satisfied. Uh, you just have to take into consideration like that. that they also have domestic politics. No, that's true. But when they say things, you know, we also have to take them at face value. Oh, sure. Otherwise, okay. we'll always be in this place that, well, nothing really matters. I never said just that. for their hard I never liner. said it doesn't matter. I just said that it's important we have to, to take into the consideration that Rouhani and, and Zarif have a lot of enemies inside Iran. And right. that they have to gain a little bit of breathing space. And but, in terms of, you know, when it comes to them saying Israel must be wiped out, there's a very good test to see whether they actually mean it. Just as there's a very good test to see whether they're going to actually be, be going to be doing, uh, be going to be living up to their, well, to their words. Have well, they we, tried to wipe Israel off the face of the earth? No, because they know what would happen. And well, in terms right. of the deal, hang on, just let me finish. In terms yeah. of the deal, we have six months. We have a very sad time. Emily, there's going to be people, IAEA inspectors, visiting our, uh, for Du and Natanz every single day. There are, and there are tourist sites in Iran that are not going to get a foreign visitor every right. single day. We will find out if they actually mean or not. This is not something well, that's going to be in the, uh, you know, that they can fudge around. 
Well, with wiping Israel off the map, obviously we're not waiting to see whether that happens or not. But I think the rhetoric itself it's is terrible. I agree with you. It's horrific. Of, I agree of, with you. No of terrible things that no should question. not be accepted no in question. any in any manner. But in any case, it sort of all comes down to okay, give Iran a little bit more time and let's see whether this is just rhetoric or whether they're actually going to be pushing the envelope, as I expect that they will be doing, mm -hmm. on whatever aspect. Again, Iran is not expected to blatantly defy the terms of the interim agreement. They have never done that. That's not the way they operate. They have, they have gone from a few hundred centrifuges to 19,000 centrifuges, not by blatantly defying anything, but always yes, they have working. Yes, the broken UN resolutions. With, wait a minute. They work they in the, they work in the gray areas of interpretation. And with regard to the resolutions, the gray area for them is show us the evidence that we have done something wrong. And because of the way the NPT is set up and because of dual use uh, technology and a whole lot of things we don't have time to go into, it's very difficult to pinpoint that. Iran takes that gray area of interpretation and abuses it in order to push its uh, program forward. That's the way they have played this game from the start. Therefore, I will expect similar things to happen, but uh, I, I, I'm going to have to uh, wrap up. Unfortunately, time has flown. I just want to say that... Tell me I what the final view should look like. Can you please No, but you? let me say I, one thing. I think we can. We have a point of agreement that we certainly have to be looking very carefully at the coming Correct. months Correct. about, you know, what's going on at Iran and how, in Iran and how they continue to try to push the envelope, whether we think it's serious, not serious, etc. That's a very valid point that you made. With regard to the final agreement, all I can, I'll say at this point, with regard to the Obama administration, Kerry and Obama himself have been talking a lot about if this fails, we'll do X, Y, Z, including the military option is on the table. My question to the Obama administration, and I think this is a question that everyone that is serious about this issue should be asking, is have you defined criteria for such failure? If you are putting such uh, emphasis on, you know, if this fails, we will do this, that, and the other, you must define the criteria for the failure. Otherwise, failures have a tendency to become very elastic things. Right. And they can be, you know, stretched in all directions. And you can find at the end of the day that if you don't want to define something as a failure, you will always find a reason to explain it away as, well, we couldn't get something better, et cetera, et cetera. So this, I think, for moving towards the comprehensive deal is a crucial, crucial uh, element of the puzzle that needs to be defined by the administration. And I think, by the way, that would go a long way to calming down congressmen, because if they knew that there was some yardstick right. for measuring what's going on, then they could be a little bit you know, more uh, uh, calm and perhaps not pushing to get a decision for sanctions that would go into effect in six but months. But what would you so like to see on the final to... agreement? On the final yeah. agreement that's in front of you, what do you want to be included? Um, look, basically everything that is worrisome with regard to the program needs to be included. Uh, Iraq needs to be shut down. Fordow needs to be shut down. Um, whatever small, uh, even symbolic enrichment is allowed, and from the interim agreement, unfortunately, we see that that's already a done deal, needs to be under constant, constant surveillance. Unfortunately, Iran has taught the international community that it cannot be trusted, and therefore it needs to be, uh, you know, 24-7 inspected. And uh, But as I said, if Iran makes the decision to back away, all of this will be made much easier. And I don't think it, I mean, nobody with regard to Syria, again, I go back to Assad. Um, there's some concerns here and there that he might be trying to hide some chemical weapons, yes. But grosso modo, because everyone understands that because of the pressure um, from Obama of possible military attack, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera 
eh, Assad was serious about joining the CWC because he understood right. that there were horrendous consequences for not joining, and therefore he is eh, eh, more or less cooperating with this. If Iran was in a similar situation, then we would probably face a similar dynamic, which would be a very positive dynamic, at least for the international community. Okay, and, and I'd like to finish with my with my idea of a final deal, which actually is very similar to yours. I think if there is a confidence building by both sides, and I think both sides could mess up. Sometimes the American domestic politics, again, purely domestic, we saw they had a shutdown there for two weeks. You know, we don't know if the Republicans tomorrow have another problem with Obama. Maybe they want to take it out, out on him on the Iran issue. So both sides, and of course, especially Iran, the onus is on them, have to live up to their expectations. And I think if at the end we see that Iran's nuclear program does not have any military element, then I would be, you know, I would agree with, you know, a limited enrichment uh, on Iranian soil under, under inspection. So everybody has a face-saving exit from this because I don't think any, any leader wants to sit in a room to negotiate where all the emergency exits have been uh, blockaded, so blocked. Mm. Uh, and in terms of, you know, how, what we do from now until then, um, I think it's very important to continue talking to the Americans. Um, I don't want to go too much into this. I don't like the way uh, Prime Minister is taking on the Americans publicly. And I think from now on we should take all our issues with the Americans who should be behind closed doors. Because all our problems that we have now with the Americans, I'm sure this is putting a very big smile on the face of Ayatollah Khamenei. And on that note, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much, Emily Landau. Uh, as usual, I really enjoyed speaking with you, uh, agreeing and disagreeing, but we, we, we ended with an agreement, which is always nice. And, um, Thanks a lot, Bea. Thank I you think, very much. Uh, I think it was a really good conversation. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So three, two, one, and stop.